We are with Peter Jacobs, um, researcher of the Human Science Research Council of South Africa and also a member of Atogusa. Uh, thank you, Peter, so much for yeah. giving us an interview. Um, I would like to begin by asking you about the labor movement in South Africa and how has it changed in the past four or five years since uh, NUMSA decided to break with the COSATU and build its own uh, labor federation? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Juan. Thanks for inviting me uh, as an activist, uh, member uh, of ABDUSA. I'm, uh, of course, part of that struggle uh, of the laboring classes in South Africa. So indeed, what happened in December uh, or towards the end of 2013, it's been a watershed movement for the labor movement because it was a special congress of NUMSA, uh, the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa, uh, where they adopted uh, really, really radical resolutions. Uh, and three of these resolutions are really outstanding and of, uh, became very important markers for the radical left. It uh, initiated an immediate debate among broad layers of the radical left in South Africa and of course also internationally about the meaning and implications of these uh, landmark uh, resolutions of, of uh, NUMSA and what it would mean for the further development of the labor movement. So let me firstly state the three important resolutions. Yes. So the first resolution has been that uh, NUMSA has decided to form a new uh, trade union federation mm -hmm. Uh, and at the same time, of course, automatically break with the Congress of South African Trade Unions, mm -hmm. where they have been the majority union for many years, yeah. you know, uh, alongside the National Union of Mine Workers. Secondly, uh, and well, well, before I move on to the second one, I think it's very important to point out that this resolution to break from, uh, to form a new federation, coincided with um, the idea and decision uh, to, uh, well, two important decisions, but one of them I think is of fundamental importance, is the traditional approach that has emerged in South Africa has been one industry, one trade union. Mm -hmm. In other words, metal workers wouldn't go outside of the boundaries of the metal industry or the industrial workers to go and organize in agriculture or in the food industry right. or in the, in the mining industry. Mm -hmm. With that decision, NUMSA basically decided that they will be willing to go and organize workers in other sectors as well, mm -hmm. specifically in the mining sector. That immediately, of course, created tensions or intensified the tensions between themselves and the National Union of, Metal Work of Mine Workers, who traditionally cons consider their turf to be, their organizing turf to be in the mining industry, right? So that's, I think, one, one aspect with a lot of implications, and there are, I think, uh, issues around in the background that m must be further discussed because it relates to the tensions between the different wings and factions within the trade union movement. But that uh, decision to form a new federation has been one of the key uh, resolutions that came out of the, the 2013 Special Congress of NUMSA. The key resolution there has been the formation of a united front to bring together workplace and community struggles. Uh, NUMSA committed a, a huge amount of their resources mm -hmm. to this formation of a united front. Now, in what, the... What kind of community struggles? Like for housing, for indeed, education, health? A, 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 whole, a whole host of these kind of struggles because South Africa, you know, as numerous researchers and others have pointed out, specifically people like Patrick Bond and so forth, mm -hmm. and a whole host of other non-governmental organizations more oriented towards uh, kind of leftist politics have pointed out that South Africa has become, once again, the so-called capital of demonstrations or unrest mm -hmm. in, uh, in recent times. What is interesting is that you don't, you, you, throughout this period, you find these struggles to be completely isolated. Mm -hmm. So there, there was the big demonstration captured in uh, you know, community struggles around housing or basic services, access mm -hmm. to water, uh, the big struggles around health, led primarily by the, 
the treatment action campaign, but there were a lot of other kind of local health movements as well, like the people's health movement, which, be, which has always been a very important part, an element of the democratic left front. And these are all different formations that you know rooted themselves in these kinds of ongoing struggles. So the struggles on a very broad front or a broad range of them mm -hmm. uh, became like a platform or a nurturing terrain or grounds for all these different formations to emerge. The problem has always been that these struggles are very fragmented, they're not united. So in that particular sense, I think the resolution of a united front became very, very important. Of course, from a theoretical perspective, a united front is a big debate, you know, what do you mean by a united front? Mm -hmm. How would leftists orientate themselves toward a united front? So these are, are big questions that have not been resolved and answered, but NUMSA took an important step towards the formation of the United Front. Mm -hmm. um, the idea back then was to launch the United Front by the beginning of 20, 2016. It, it, were, it never succeeded in doing that. Uh, nevertheless, a whole host of different United Front structures emerged very unevenly across the different provinces. Uh, it became very strong in the Gauteng Johannesburg region, uh, largely engineered by the Numsha leadership in that area and a couple of leftist groups, and was also fairly prominent in the in the Western Cape, Cape Town, Cape Town region. Outside those two areas, it never really gained a lot of traction. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, there was an, an initial uh, step towards that. And then the final element of the resolution, in, ad in addition to the formation of a new trade union federation, the uh, formation of a united front, there was the decision to form a workers' party. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now this, of course, was a, a, an indictment of the South African Communist Party, who has always seen itself as the representative of the South African proletariat, you know, the, the leadership of the proletariat, whether they sort of deserve to be called the leadership of the proletariat. I mean, that is a big uh, debating issue. Uh, but NUMSA was bold enough to put that on the, uh, on the platform and uh, as part of their key resolutions. Um, so the first phase of this workers' party development became known as a kind of movement for socialism. Yeah? It wasn't called a workers' party. It's now more in the last couple of months mm -hmm. that they started you know, calling it very explicitly that they, they now want to form uh, a workers' party. Why that is the case, it's, it's, not, it's not very, very clear. But one can look at a whole host of different uh, circumstances that have changed that might have influenced their decision to move towards the formation now very explicitly of a workers' party. Of course, it raises a whole host of other questions. If you have structures of the United Front still in existence, how will those structures relate to the workers' party, right? Uh, how will the trade unions relate to the workers' party? What would be the base of the workers' party? And so forth. But these are unanswered questions. NUMSA has not been able to come forward with these questions. So once again, to sum up, I think the significance of these resolutions is that the three resolutions, breaking away with Kassat and forming a new federation, forming a united front to bring workplace and community struggles together, and the formation of a workers' party via the notion of a, of a movement for socialism, they're really, really very bold steps on the side of NUMSA in trying to give leadership uh, to you know, a very incipient movement in South Africa to break free or form a kind of leftist regroupment or left formation uh, for the further development of the South African Revolution. Mm -hmm. And it seems as if at the moment it is, it is at a point where NUMSA is unable to find a way forward on all three of these kind of ventures. It will be interesting to see how this how this pans out, and it would be interesting to see how different currents of the radical left in South Africa would orientate themselves towards these particular developments. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, how how has this um, all these initiatives uh, from NUMSA uh, impacted? How how has this changed the political landscape in general? Breaking with the the COSATU means breaking with the ANC and and the party that has been in power since uh, 94. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and with the uh, South African Communist Party, what, what is the, re the reflection of this in the political landscape, not so much in the, in the labor movement? Yeah. So may maybe we should step, take one step back. 
that the NUMSA resolutions followed upon very, very important uh, developments within the labor movement mm -hmm. uh, in the couple of years uh, preceding the NUMSA resolutions. There was one very important uh, development uh, that made a very big impact and that is very hard to ignore, which was the Marikana Massacre. Mm -hmm. The Marikana Massacre was basically the, a very uh, important point that, that sort of shocked the nation, as it were, and shocked the working class. Uh, because, yeah, a government that a lot of people expected to be on the side of the working class, a so-called working class government, mm -hmm and specifically Z Zuma, who after he came to uh, the presidency or rose to the presidency of the ANC, was put there by Kasatu. I mean, the labor movement with, that is aligned to the ANC, they played a prominent role in getting Zuma elected to the president. Mm -hmm. yeah? And so never, nobody ever expected that the, uh, that the government that is so linked to the working class would ever utilize the armed forces, the wing of the state, of the bourgeois state, against the working class. Mm -hmm. And this forced the trade union movement almost like into a corner or into a decision point. You know, we have to make a statement of how do we orientate ourselves towards mm -hmm. the state, towards the ANC, and towards other kind of leftist formations, in specifically the one that claims to represent the working, the working class of the South African Communist Party it might open up a situation where a possibility for NUMSA to be closely aligned to the Economic Freedom Fighters, another right. outfit that has broken away from the ANC, you know, after the expulsion of, of Julius Malema. So that is another kind of political possibility. However, in recent, if you, if you look at the events over the last uh, couple of years, or the, the, the last, say, 12 to 13 months, uh, especially after the local government elections, this possibility uh, if it if it comes to uh, fruition, you know, <laughs> is going to be uh, you know counterproductive for the NUMSA leadership in putting forward a kind of working class uh, you know position. Why? Because the EFF is increasingly exposing itself as just another kind of uh, a party with a, with a very, very strong bourgeois inclinations. Mm -hmm. You know, the leadership of the EFF, they've been in, implicated in a whole host of different corruption scandals themselves. Julius Malema himself is, is a person who's accumulating wealth and, and so forth and so on. And uh, what is troubling, of course, is the fact that uh, the EFF has already been here to the United States. The leadership came here, the leadership the went to... Yeah, 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 exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and, and through this particular process, they've been interacting with business councils of the in, within the imperialist countries. Now, uh, a, a, a party with a radical credentials or radical orientation, why, if it is such a m minority, would uh, be so strongly inclined towards interacting with business councils uh, of imperialism? And these meetings, a lot of them were initiated by the business councils of the Germans and the Americans and the British within South Africa. And so this is, uh, this is a troubling uh, situation. So for is, there, is there a disconnect between the rhetoric of the economic freedom fighters and what their actual program? Do they have a, a rhetoric that is far to the left of what they're doing? Yes. Or, yeah, they yeah. The rhetoric and the program actually it's, it's far to the left. But mm -hmm. the actions and practices okay. of the, of, of the uh, EFF, they are uh, <laughs> very far to the right. Mm -hmm. And so that is it. Of course, the EFF people uh, and leaders are trying to uh, sort of paper over this. They are trying to say, well, to justify uh, this thing by saying, well, you have to talk to all the different you know, stakeholders or all the forces involved in the kind of political process in South Africa. Now, now why are they doing that? Uh, uh, you know, trying to justify these, um, you know, there's nothing that is happening through their own, uh, you know, strong interest in accumulation itself. You know, if you are committed, I don't think there is consistency between your commitment to a revolutionary strategy or revolutionary cause and accumulation within the leadership itself. Yeah, there is a, there is a very, very strong contradiction within that. And uh, I mean, these things are popping up in scandals all over the place. I mean, Julius Malema's big house that had to be sold, Julius Malema's um, 
uh, problems with the South African uh, revenue services. Yeah, there the were tons of scandals. Yes, yes, yes. So, so, so he's not the only one, of course. There are a whole host of other people within the leadership of the EFF mm -hmm. where, you, where you have uh, this, uh, this issue. But uh, certainly there is this massive contradiction between the rhetoric, what they write in their programmatic statements, and what they're actually doing. Mm -hmm. Now, there is another element of the EFF I think that is very, very important. The EFF does not have a base in the labor movement. The EFF's base is with, within the unemployed, uh, especially sections of the unemployed youth. Uh, so if you go back, for example, to the recent uh, Fees Must Fall struggles, they became a very prominent voice very quickly there mm -hmm. because that has mm -hmm. been the, the, the traditional uh, platform through which they've been able to, to mobilize themselves. Now, whether they be, will be able to sustain that, it's, 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 it's very unknown. So it's, it's not... Uh, what is in the case of NUMSA, if it, is, if it succeeds in the formation of a workers' party, where the base will be grounded within the trade union movement because there would be strong you know, base within the, the uh, NUMSA itself, and then the United Front can also be a very, very strong platform for such a, uh, a workers' party if it, if it is to materialize or if it is to, to arise. Now, that will change the political landscape very, very dramatically and drastically, but there is a very strong tendency for the ANC to be losing power at the national level very, very fast, and it's a whole host of different factors uh, contribute to, towards it. On the one hand, it's a, uh, a factor I think that we cannot deny, which is the corruption issues mm -hmm. surrounding the ANC. I mean, yeah. it's not only Zuma that is embroiled in corruption, it's also the issues that I've mentioned earlier on. I mean, uh, after the 2012 uh, massacre, I think the ANC made a strategic error with Cyril Ramaphosa being so high up because this was a very prominent event and incident for workers and uh, NUMSA uh, adopted a very strange position uh, in, in that election I, and even in the 20, uh, 2016 election. They didn't say do not vote ANC, they just said we are not going to, I mean they made two basic statements. We are breaking now from our traditional practice, which is number one, we take money from the union and give it towards the ANC for its electoral. Number two, we use our union infrastructure as a platform to rally workers to vote ANC. Mm -hmm. So those two things, they stopped. They stopped doing. Yeah. Now those was a very very significant uh, developments, and only the NUMSA did that. Uh, only NUMSA did that after breaking with the society. Yeah. Uh, so 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 those were very very significant uh, developments. I think in the uh, in the changeover and changing the kind of uh, uh, pol political landscape in that particular period. Now there is another element, I think that is very very important that has reared its head in the last couple of years in South Africa's electoral or national political landscape. Uh, it's what is called the increasing tendency of people to abstain from elections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you find it at two levels. In, South, in the South African electoral system, you have to register before the actual vote takes place to show that you are an eligible citizen of South Africa, you know, able to vote. That in itself has declined quite substantially. So now we do not have, you know, huge numbers of people voting. Yeah, we do not have huge numbers of people registering for elections. What's the turnout in a normal in, election, in national election? For yeah, example? the the registration process is declined from uh, virtually ninety percent to about uh, seventy percent. That's the registration. Yeah, I, the the actual election itself has. Uh, uh, has fallen even further back. It is in the in the region of say 55 to 60 percent mm -hmm. of eligible voters who are now going out into the polls. So, uh, if you you get closer to the U.S. Yes, if you if now now this is a very big debate. What does it really mean, f it, it, you know, politically? Does it mean that people are beginning to get disillusioned with bourgeois democracy? Does it mean that people are getting just disillusioned with bourgeois parties and not necessarily with bourgeois democracy? Right. Does it mean that people are looking for uh, an alternative to the bourgeois parties? These are, are, are politicized. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, if, if people are beginning... That's most yes, pessimistic. Yeah, that, uh, is, that, is a, that, that is most pessimistic, but it is very hard to align that with the massive rise in protest movements. Right. Yeah? So if people have, uh, would become completely you know, depoliticized and demobilized, mm -hmm. your, your, the, 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 uh, the tendency for mass political protests and demonstrations mm -hmm. would, would really take a, 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 a massive setback. Uh, and that is, th those are the contradictions, I think, of the South African political reality. Uh, and that is what we have to kind of work out. That is what we have to work through. So uh, it is, you know, from our, from the Abdusa perspective, it is not, uh, you know, advisable for the left just to say, well, we abstain from elections because a lot of people are no longer voting. We have to find, a f figure out a way of how to change um, you know, uh, utilize the electoral arena as a way to put forward an alternative politics. Because you can't deny that it is still within the electoral period where you have heightened interest in politics. You've got to find uh, anti-neoliberal, anti-capitalist, anti-bourgeois methods of, you know, uh, you know uh, parliamentary, uh, you know, struggle. That is what I think uh, is, 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 is an issue that the, the radical left in South Africa must figure out and work out. There's, there's no clarity on that. The NUMSA experience in the, in the heartland where they've got a base, like in the Eastern Cape, among auto workers in the auto industry, that's an interesting example, but it hasn't yet materialized in a similar way as, for example, Operation Kanyisa, which is an operation that started around the anti-privatization movement in Soweto, where they've been able to, through local government elections, elect councillors. But these councillors are operating on a very radical platform, and that is in Soweto. It's just a small part of Soweto where Operation Kanyisa councillors are operating almost in Lenin's term revolutionary parliamentarism in a small scale. They are fully accountable to the party, all the money that they get as councillors go to the party, and all that money, then they get a, s a salary paid by the party, uh, and uh, they uh, hold meetings with the communities, and they utilize their parliamentary position as a way to mobilize, uh, you know, an active citizens citizenry, uh, as it were, uh, in, in kind of revolutionary politics. Now, that has not expanded beyond the Soweto area, uh, that is the highest form of where we've been able to succeed, to, to come in terms of, you know, politics. Um, so, with the, uh, it's clear that the ANC is in a big crisis, yeah. right? And, and it can be, we can draw a parallel with other um, traditional center or center-left parties, like the Socialist Party in, in France or in Spain, the Communist parties in Europe in general. Um, and we see this EFF uh, rising, maybe similar to some new uh, organizations like Podemos, which don't have a clear, you know, uh, revolutionary left or working class based uh, left platform. Um, so, you think that? Do you think that if NUSA manages to build this working class party? that could represent an opportunity for the left to intervene and, and maybe um, reproduce this uh, example of Soveto at the, in a larger um, uh, stage, at a larger level? It, certainly, it, it is a big possibility, but in order to do so, I think it is very important for NUMSA comrades themselves to figure out how not only you know, you can very easily fall into uh, the trap of electoralism. Mm -hmm. And once you fall into a tra the trap of electoralism, you can de degenerate very, very fast. I mean, that's all these experiences that, that you've just enumerated. I mean, if we study them carefully, the degeneration is virtually built into them from, from birth, mm -hmm. you know. And so this is the struggle that, that NUMSA is, uh, finds itself uh, in as well. So I think what is clearly required at this, at this particular point is that NUMSA should be able to firstly uh, realize that they can't do it alone. 
They've got a very strong base within the trade union movement. Mm -hmm. They have a very big initiative on the United Front, even though it's uh, you know very, very vacillating and very wobbly. Uh, but these are very, very important initiatives in terms of having a very strong base. It is the connection and combination between that strong base and a radical politics, I think, that they've got to try and focus on. And if they want to arrive at this kind of radical political you know, depth, they have to be able to, to build stronger alliances with other sections of the radical left. And other sections of the radical left, of course, must approach this uh, development with a, more, with a greater open-mindedness, which means automatically breaking free from sectarianism and all sorts of other tiny, uh, tiny uh, factionalism. But the NUMSA process itself is, is a process with, with I think, uh, a lot, a lot of potential. Do you see any potential in NUMSA converging with more of a, a youth that is st standing up and fighting in a more anti-capitalist uh, perspective? Well, uh, you saw signs of it at the time of the um, of the when the Fismas Four movement was at its head, at, at, at its uh, you know uh, highest point, at its height. Uh, remember the Fismas IV movement, you know, was ex came to the fore as an explosion, and then it sort of went into a decline, and then it sort of rose up again. Now these were two different phases of the Fismas IV movement, and they in character and in essence are completely different. The first phase was really progressive. Why? Because at two or three of the universities, the Fismas IV struggle managed to integrate itself with struggles of workers against outsourcing. Yeah? And outsourcing was basically a different struggle of part-time temporary work of the service component within the university. Yeah? So the lowest uh, level workers who are in the catering, in the cleaning and so forth, their services get outsourced to other private companies you know, who come and just exploit them to the extreme and pay them a pittance. Now these workers at those universities, specifically the one where Rhodes Must Fall broke out, which is the UCT, and at Wits University, uh, these struggles, students were behind them and mobilized for them for quite a while, right? Now, when the Fees Must Fall movement came on board, it was immediate an immediate convergence between these two. Solidarity struggles with workers, uh, you know, fighting for, you know, living, uh, wage conditions mm -hmm. and better contracts with, at the universities uh, against what they call colonial education, which is the roads uh, must fall, and then you know uh, the conditions uh, of students, not uh, you know of the state providing for you know tuition fees of uh, of poor students, you know subsidizing it uh, uh, more. And so in this first phase, you've, you've, you've seen the convergence of these. In the, when the Fees Must Fall struggle flared up again, that struggle was largely contained. Now that was done partly through the creative intervention of university bureaucratic administrations. The first phase of the struggle, they, it was a victory for those coalitions mm -hmm. because they managed to get the, 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 the demand of most of the workers being that uh, they've got to have it, what is called insourcing, that the that the service, the workers who are providing service at the university should become part of the university payroll and no longer you know, subject to these other private companies coming in. Now that struggle, a lot of the universities just caved in, and and I think uh, probably some of the leaders at the universities saw that if we don't compromise on this, mm. it can bring the university into a revolutionary point, you know, where the the its insurgency can go much wider, yeah. So uh, you can see that um, in exchange of keeping the fees. Yes. Basically, they, they, yeah. they divided the movement. In yes. The so, so, so they managed to to to, to really uh, get the the movement divided, but the state on it on its own part intervened at the at the same time, and the state intervened on on the compromise it, it itself. The state compromised at two levels. Yeah. The first level of the compromise was that uh, in, in the phase one no increase in the next year. Mm -hmm. The following period was, we are going to increase uh, only up to a certain percentage e in line with the inflation and no 
uh, fees, fee increments for poor students or zero fees for, for poor students. So that was the state's compromise. Mm -hmm. yeah? uh, and so uh, that second phase uh, of, the, of, the, of the struggle was an important phase of the struggle in which um, this, it became almost confined to the fees. Mm -hmm. Those other dimensions or, you know, with, the, with the larger political implications about the co against the co colonial <laughs> in curriculum and, and so forth, those things were not prominent in the struggle anymore. So, in, 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 you know, so the second phase of this fees must fall already became an indicative that the fees must fall movement was basically in retreat. Mm. Politically, it was in retreat, yeah, so because it became a pure simplistic economistic demand despite all the, all the potential. It is in that first phase where it had a lot of the potential and where it scored a legitimate victory. Mm. But the challenge there was to convert that, that victory not only into an organizational victory but into a political victory, to translate that victory into something outside where those forces could join up with the United Front of the NUMSA and then be permanent or structured members of the United Front. That dynamic never took place. That dynamic never took place. So, so this is the, the difference that you're having is that you can uh, score the victory against the state, but do we really score the victory in terms of you know, the accumulation of revolutionary forces? Mm -hmm. I think that is the challenge that, we, that we're confronting. So uh, in the second phase of the Fees Must Fall movement, NUMSA really uh, showed some kind of sclerosis or paralysis in getting itself to show solidarity mm. or an alliance with the, mm. yeah. And I don't know how to explain that, but that might partly be linked to the fact that now the Fees Must Fall movement was really divorced from or alien from any you know, workers' movement. But if we had, in the first phase of that Fees Must Fall, been able to consolidate a much stronger United Front organizational force with the workers uh, at, at the, at, in other words, those workers who were now allowed to be, they, the workers' committees became transformed into kind of union factions. If we could have incorporated those union factions into some kind of United Front process, mm -hmm. it would have been a different outcome, I think, in the second phase as well. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Good.